be seated.
scripture with us as we begin our prayer time. This is what the Lord has commanded. For what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering. And everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and for your kindness to us. We thank you for that powerful, wonderful, beautiful name that you have given to us to honor you simply by saying the name of Jesus. We pray you would take these offerings, these gifts that we bring, multiply them many times over, that that name of yours, Jesus, might be praised from here all the way through eternity. And we would give you the glory and the power and the honor. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
be the center of my life. Jesus be the center of my life. This morning, as we sang when we began, we don't want just to be about words and thoughts, mindless repetition, but Father, we want it to be about the sincere desire of our hearts. And Father, that is that you'd be the center of our life, the center of our church, 
the center of our universe. And the Father, everything that happens in this world be something that brings you honor and glory. So be with our ears that we may listen closely. Be with our minds that we may engage. And be with Pastor Chuck. And may the Holy Spirit speak through him. We ask that in your names. Amen. Thank you, AJ, April, Zoe, the praise team, the instrumentalists, the choir. It, it, I told you before, I, I love this worship. I hope you have worshiped today. It was, it was great. One of my favorite songs is Revelation songs. Thank you, AJ and April particularly. Paul Arms is the... Uh, Interim president of Howard Payne University, and he is fond of saying, I've been hired to be fired. I'm excited about your church. This next Sunday you'll have a pastor in view of a call. Won't that be great? Won't that be great? Thank you. I, I've had a wonderful time. Connie's had a wonderful time. We thank you for this opportunity. And uh, we now have you in our hearts. So thank you again. The date was May 31st, 1792. The place, Kettering, England. The audience, a group of Baptist ministers. The speaker was William Carey. The content of his message was this, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. The result on October 2nd, 1792, the Baptist Missionary Society was founded. It was the forerunner for our modern missionary movement. Two weeks ago, we affirmed this church in three categories. The place of Scripture, the place of our doctrinal beliefs, and the place of missions and evangelism. Honestly, we could have spent hours, perhaps even all day, discussing all the good things about First Baptist Church, San Angelo. I affirm you again for those things, and I thank you for your ministry in this city, in this state, in this country, and literally around the world. I am grateful for First Baptist San Angelo. Last week, I used Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 to 5, to share what needs improvement in this church and in churches around our state and around our country. The bottom line is that churches have lost their first love. They are no longer focused on what they need to be focused on. We have a very difficult time, it seems, keeping the main thing the main thing. You and I must love God supremely and love others as ourselves. That's the main thing. What's right? What's wrong? What now? How can we enhance what is right about our church and correct what is wrong about our church? Our text this morning is Isaiah chapter 54, and I'm reading verses 2 to 3. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of your habitations. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall break forth on the right hand and on the left. From this same text came William Carey's sermon, which in my opinion is the answer to the issues in San, An San Angelo, Texas. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. How do we get a handle on those imperatives? Those imperatives are significant for the future of this church and any church. But we've got to have some handles. We've got to have some practical things that we can do. There is a command and a promise found in this passage that is Carrie's text. They will help us get some handles to answer the challenges. The command is this. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Enlarge and stretch out. That's the answer. Enlarge and stretch out. The commandment from my perspective is that we are to grow. We are to grow both quantitatively 
and qualitatively. Like most churches here in America, we've stopped doing both. Now, I know there's exceptions. I'm not talking about those people who are exceptions. I'm talking about us in general. We are not growing. In our case, we could say that we're waiting for a new pastor to lead us to growth. I've been a part of many churches that had an interim situation, and honestly, that's the attitude every time. Well, we just wait for the pastor. We're going to get a new pastor. He's going to lead us in the direction that we need to go, and we wait for the new pastor to do that. Now, there's some truth in that. I'm not, I'm not saying that's not true. We're going to get some new ideas, some new direction, some new thinking, some new vision uh, for the future. But honestly, that's not in line with the Great Commission. As individuals and as a church body, we need to be making disciples right now. Right now. We don't have to wait for a pastor. A pastor will lead us. We're glad for that. But we don't have to wait for a pastor. And in fact, Jesus says, get out there and make disciples right now. According to these verses, we are to grow. We are to increase. We are to reach out. Our purpose is to win and train people for God. As long as there are lost people out there, people who do not know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, our mission, our job, our command is to make disciples. We're to stretch out and enlarge. A couple of old song titles might help us. I was invited one time to sing for Gideon's International at a song, uh, at a uh, convention in uh, Cleburne, and they asked me to sing a song, and I chose People Need the Lord. People Need the Lord. No matter their state, people need the Lord. A second song uh, came about to me way back in the 60s. Some of you will remember those days. Yes, my birthday was yesterday. Yes, I had a great one. Yes, it was a big one, etc. But in 1967, I was invited to sing the solo from the Good News musical, Do You Really Care? People need the Lord. Do you really care? I got to visit with the uh, writer of that musical, and he and I sat down, and he said, uh, who are you caring for about becoming a believer? Whoa. I mentioned my best friend who lived across the street from me. He and I had had many conversations about becoming a Christian. As far as I know, even today, he has not made that commitment. But that was the thing that drove me as I sang that song several times that Glorietta was introduced out there, and we sang it several times. Do you really care? Do you really care? It made the song live for me because I identified a person, a person for whom I genuinely cared. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 from the NIV says this, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all those who live that all those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again the truth is our world is filled with negative things it is filled with negative things. You will go to work. You will go uh, to the grocery store. You will go uh, to a retail store. You will go to the gas station and the post office and all the places you'll visit tomorrow, and you will find negativism. It's not all negative. I don't mean that, but I do mean negativism. And so when we start thinking about the church and what this church needs in order to become what it needs to be in this city, we feel a little negative. The truth is that pessimism and cynicism and criticism and unfocused vision will not accomplish the command. It must be the love of Christ that compels us. You and I cannot manufacture that. I cannot get up in the morning and say, okay, today, God, I'm going to love everybody. 
I can't do that unless Christ lives his life out through me and speaks through me and thinks through me and lives through me. Christ's love compels us. People need the Lord. Do you really care? I'm speaking to myself, guys. I'm not speaking just to you. I have to deal with this almost every day. Students, dozens and hundreds of students pass my path. Do I really care? In the last part of verse 2 of the text are three things that must be done in order for us to obey the command to enlarge and stretch out. I'm choosing to address these in reverse order for emphasis. You'll see that in a moment. I recall a time when I was a young youth minister at First Baptist Church in Conroe, Texas. One of the wealthiest men in Texas came to me and suggested a fundraiser for our youth ministry. It was a circus. I'm not talking about chaos. It was a literal circus. He wanted us to do a circus to raise money. I can't tell you the number of things that we did to promote that circus. I think we lost more money on that event than any other event I've done for fundraiser. That guy did help us out, so I was able to save some face. But we did have some fun with the circus. If you've never been around a circus, then you probably won't understand this. But it was, it was a great time. There just weren't very many people there. One of the things we did was we went out to a field where they were setting up the tent. For those of you who've been to circus, you know those circus tents are big. They're 100 yards long or more. And so we went out to watch them, and the elephants pulled the tent up. And then this giant machine drove the stakes, which were three and four feet long, into the ground to hold up the tent. Shallow stakes would not hold up that tent. It had to be big. They had to be long. They had to be deep in order for that huge tent uh, to, stay, to stay standing. If you and I are going to enlarge and stretch out our tent here at First Baptist to reach people, there are some stakes that we need to drive down deep. The first one is not painful for me to talk about, but it is painful for me, and I suspect you, to do. The first stake is our personal devotional lives. The church will only be as strong as the individual personal devotional lives of the members. If we are not fully devoted followers of Christ, spending time with Him on a regular basis in personal worship, the likelihood of our church doing anything is very, very slim. Just like a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, so it is with our devotional lives. In fact, I tell my students all the time, if I could only tell them one thing, and I think I know a couple of things that they need to do in church, if I could only tell them one thing, I would say to them, take care of your own spiritual health. I say that to you today. I say it to me. Take care of your own spiritual health by spending time with the Lord in personal worship on a regular basis, not sporadic, on a regular basis. While all of us might agree with that, what's interesting to me is we think that it's important, because we, but because we are so busy and need to eliminate activities from our lives, one of the first things that goes is our personal devotional life. I sat across the table from a very important man, a man uh, several years ago. You might even know him. I'm not going to call his name. He's wonderful. He's a great friend, and he's a wonderful minister. And he told me face to face, you know, Chuck, I don't spend as much time with God on a regular basis because I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Would you think about this for a moment? 
If you're too busy to spend time with the creator of the universe who has saved you from your sins, has given you a reason and purpose to live, then you're too busy. You're too busy. I'm too busy if I can't take time out of my day to spend it, some of it, with Christ. Personal worship. Last week I spoke of returning to genuine worship. I was not just speaking of corporate worship. Corporate worship is really important. I I have a great time here every Sunday. But corporate worship will fail if we don't have personal worship. When I was in Lubbock, we had a deal in, on Thursday nights called Paradigm. Some of you may have even attended. Paradigm was a Bible study slash worship service that John Randalls, my friend, uh, started, and then he spoke at it for many years. Now, what you might not know about Lubbock, Texas, is that Thursday night really is the end of the week. It's really the end of the week. If there's a class on Friday, it's real unusual that people go to class. I'm just saying. I watched young people, students, praise God, raise their hands, sing out loud, cry, lay down in the aisle, and humble themselves before God in those worship services and walk out the door and go five blocks to the depot district and get drunk. Happened every Thursday night. It's the end of the week. I've had my religious fix. I'm going down to the depot district. I kept wondering in my mind what it was that caused that. How could that be that they would have such a wonderful corporate worship experience and yet go do that? Now, that's not the only thing. That was just the thing that was on my mind at the time. And then I heard J.R. Vassar speak at Southwestern Seminary in a youth ministry meeting And he said this, and the moment he said it, and I've quoted it hundreds of times, the moment he said it, I knew what the problem was. He said the altars of corporate worship are crumbling because the altars of personal worship have crumbled. We need to spend time with God on a regular basis in personal worship. Quiet time is not just for young people. It's for everyone who calls himself or herself a believer. It's not either or. It's both and. It's not either corporate worship or personal worship. It's both corporate worship and personal worship. If you want to enter to the next phase, the next chapter of your church in a healthy way. We need to spend time with God in personal worship. A second stake that needs to be driven down in our hearts and soul is that we need to strengthen our Sunday school ministry. I don't know all the statistics of this church regarding Sunday school, but I do know that in decades past, It was one of the strongest organizations of Sunday school in this state. First Baptist San Angelo was one of the models of Sunday school. It was effective. It was reaching people. We were winning people here. But somehow that kind of got lost in the shuffle. Now, I'm not saying there's not good Sunday school going on here. Please don't hear me say that. I affirm what you do. We need to start thinking pretty clearly about how we can reach and minister to people through our Sunday school. Because I worked at Lifeway Christian Resources for so many years, you can imagine all the reasons we heard that Sunday school was outdated. It was an old dinosaur, had an antiquated name, and the materials were just too hard to use. I can't tell you the number of calls I got dealing with those very things. I would go to a conference and those would be the questions people would ask. Many would say that we have tried it and it just doesn't work. To that statement, I reply, Sunday school has not been tried and found wanting. Real Sunday school has not been tried
Think with me for a moment about just what Sunday school does. Now, I'm talking about the people in Sunday school. I'm talking about the organization that is developed so that Sunday school can be effective. Number one, it reaches people for Christ and our church. In the 21st century, the worship service seems to be the open door for people to come for the first time. Actually, the website is the first open door. But the worship service is important. We, we do it well. But the Sunday school also has a responsibility to reach people for Christ. Secondly, it teaches people the Bible. Now, I'm not saying we don't try to teach people the Bible in this worship service. We do. I do. I've wanted to share with you things that I've known to be true and just didn't have an opportunity to say it. And I've had an opportunity to say it. The Bible is God's Word. We have this opportunity to teach it in our worship services. But quite frankly, honestly, most people do not apply the Word of God to their lives in large settings Research shows us that they apply the Word of God to their lives in small, intimate settings. Welcome to Sunday School. It teaches people the Bible. It ministers to people who are in need. I, I have been responsible for hospital vi- visitation. I've been responsible to go and visit uh, people who have lost family members. And when I get there, the Sunday School members are already there. They minister to people. That's part of the job of a Sunday school class and department. Adult Sunday school departments and classes are the source of leadership for other areas of the church. You want somebody to teach children? You go to an adult class or adult Sunday school department. You want somebody to lead a choir or or music thing? You go to an adult Sunday school department or class. They're the source. They're the source. We cannot ignore that. I know people who come to Sunday school to rest. I'm saying that Sunday school is not the place to rest. Sunday school is the time to prepare to work. Finally, it helps people to begin to understand the work of this church and of our denomination. We begin to understand what the Baptist General Convention of Texas does in Texas, and not only in Texas but around the world. We begin to understand what missions is and how that spreads out through uh, our state and our country and and the world. We begin to understand that because of Sunday school classes. You'll see things just referenced in Sunday school lessons as, as you study. I honestly don't care what we call it. I used to get pretty bent out of shape about that. Now I'm older and I don't care. Sorry. I'm not even married to a specific time for Sunday school. It was three months before I figured out we actually had Sunday school at 9 o'clock here and not 9.30. So obviously I'm not married to that. In fact, I'm not even married to having it on Sunday. Because you know what? In San Angelo, Texas, there are hundreds of people who can't come to church on Sunday morning. So what do we do? We have Sunday school for them. We take it to the streets. We go to where they are. Sometimes that's in a person's home. Home Bible study is a very popular uh, experience in the 21st century. Problem is, home Bible study and Bible study here at the building are two different things. One is really for the teaching of information. The other one is for fellowship. What we have to do is kind of merge those in somebody's house. I've told pastors, we need to do both and. We need to have it here at the church, but we also need to have Bible study or Sunday school or whatever you want to call it out in people's houses. We can also do it in local restaurants. I've done Bible studies in local restaurants. You can do it at coffee shops. You can spend time in a circle with four or five people and have a meaningful Bible study in a coffee shop. You can do it in the dining rooms of businesses around this this city. I don't care what you call it. I don't even care what time you meet. 
But we need to teach people the Bible. We need to teach them. It is our lifeblood, guys. It's our lifeblood. It's the thing that keeps us going. Christ's love compels us. Now, where'd you get that? Out of the Scripture. We got that out of the Scripture. The churches that work through the various classes that meet on Sunday morning, Sunday school is a Bible teaching arm of the church, but it is also the reaching arm of the church. When people visit our worship services, Sunday school classes make contact with them. When people are in the hospital or have deaths in their families, the Sunday school is there to help. When there are physical needs in the lives of members, the Sunday school is usually there first to address those needs. The Sunday school is also the assimilation organization of our church. There are about three, 400 people here. It's really hard to break into that group. The Sunday school offers that. It brings people into a small group where there can be relationships and opportunities uh, to learn. Truth be told, we cannot, cannot afford for the stake of Sunday school not to be driven down deep if this church is going to survive. Again, I don't care what you call it. We've got to have Bible study. We've got to have Bible study. I get to be in lots of churches. Most all of them need workers, especially in preschool, children, youth, and young adult areas of the ministry. We all know that we are not saved to sit. We are saved to serve. If you don't have a place to serve right now, consider letting someone on the leadership staff here know that you are willing to serve. I'm not saying they're going to give you a job next week. You might need some training. You might need some help in understanding the material. But I am saying that we will try to utilize you in service to this church. One last stake needs to be driven down. It is the ministry to our membership. Besides the ministries that take place on staff and through the Sunday school, there's the work of the deacon body. I read almost every week that Robert Dillard has gone to a hospital somewhere to talk and visit with someone who is in the hospital. We don't have a pastor, so, hey, it falls to deacons. I appreciate that. I think that's what we need to be doing. The most important things in the lives of our members from their perspectives is their needs. The church must be about the task of meeting those spiritual needs, whatever they may be spiritual and physical needs. So drive down these three stakes. Personal devotional life. You and I need to spend time with God in personal worship. The work of the Sunday school and the ministry to our members. So we need to strengthen our stakes, but we also need to lengthen the cords. Lengthen the cords. The larger the tent, the more we grow. The more we reach people, the greater the need to lengthen the cords of our church to provide for people. We must raise our sights to see that there are lots, underline the word lots, of people to be reached in San Angelo, Texas. Some we are already reaching and ministering to, but we need to reach out to touch even more lives. Perhaps it's nursing homes or special ed folks or deaf people or the masses of people who live in apartments, people with different culture and ideas than we have, children, youth, and adults, especially college-age adults in a college town. The fields are so ripe to be harvested. (coughs) Several years ago, I was at Ridgecrest representing Lifeway. I was leading conferences on youth Sunday school with a lot of friends. After the service one night, another consultant and I went to the movies in Asheville, which was not very far. After the evening worship service, we went. Keith turned to me and said, what does youth Sunday school have to say to all these people? There were hundreds of people getting ready to go into theater, most of them young and young adults. A sobering question. What do we have to say to the masses of people who don't know Christ? We must reach out to all kinds of people. We must be at it all the time. We must keep on keeping on. The people need us, and the Lord has commanded it. 
He didn't suggest it. He said, if you think about it, why don't you reach out to people? No, it's a command. We need to be about the business of disciple making. Finally, these words in the passage to close this message. Now remember, I've done that in reverse order. I've done it in reverse order. Roman numeral three is spare not. Spare not. In the NIV, it says, do not hold back. Do not hold back. If we're going to enlarge our tent and stretch out to reach people, it's going to cost something. There's a price to be paid. Now, if you are already giving faithfully and sacrificially to the ministry of this church, I am not talking to you. I'm not. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. My job is to bring awareness. So I want you to be aware of this. I don't know the exact numbers, but I suspect in a church our size that there are dozens of people and families who give less than $100 a year to this church. If our churches, like normal churches our size, Dozens of people, less than $100. God will start with you right where you are. I am so far in debt, I can't possibly give 10%. God will start with you where you are. Commit to give a certain amount, and, and the commitment includes, I'm going to move toward trying to tithe my income. I believe God will honor your desire. If your desire is to reach people and make a difference in the lives of people, it's going to cost us something. There's a need for a spiritual revolution in this church and in this city, but revolutions do not place on, take place on pocket change and spare time. God wants all of it. He wants all of us. He wants us to be involved in the ministry of this church, in this community, in this state, and in the world. It will take a total commitment of our lives to Christ. George Bernard Shaw said it this way. You've heard me say this before. You see things as they are and ask why. I dream dreams that never were and ask why not? Why not? Did you know that it takes over $1 million to conduct a Dallas Cowboy game in a regular season game? $1 million dollars. To, connect, uh, to conduct a Dallas Cowboy game. Professional athletes get millions of dollars for their athletic prowess. Just this week, Manny Machaca got a contract for $300 million for 10 years. That's $30 million a year to play baseball. Movie stars make millions for each movie they make, and for what? Entertainment, entertainment, entertainment. We are in the business of reaching people for eternity, for eternity. Strengthen your stakes, lengthen your cords, spare not. The command for FBC and for us as individuals is to enlarge the tent, to stretch out, and to spare not. The promise is found in verse 3. It's the good news. We do all those things. Now, we're not doing them as a, a mechanism. We're doing them because God has commanded us to do them. For you will break forth on the right hand and on the left. We will grow. We will teach the Bible. We will meet spiritual needs. We will meet physical needs. If we follow the command of God, God will be faithful to add to our church those who are being saved. William Carey said it, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. David Harrell is my friend. He was the minister of music at First Baptist Church in Conroe when Bill was at Oak Ridge Baptist. Uh, he's a good guy. He shared with me a story of one of his friends who was in an accident 
and boom, he was a paraplegic. The man said he was depressed for about 20 minutes. For about 20 minutes. And then ask the question which I ask you in this moment. What now? What now? I don't know the decision you need to make today, or if there's a decision you need to make today. But we're going to offer one, and Vince and I will be here at the front, and we will, we will receive you for whatever that decision is. We will pray with you. We'll try to guide you in the right process. If you want to come and be a member of our church, we'll take that information and seek your letter from wherever you are coming from. We want you because we need people to reach this city. What now? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for its ministry. I thank you for its concern, its care, its willingness to invest in missions and evangelism. But I also pray that you will help us to see the future and head toward it. We need to do what you want us to do. Even as we have this invitation, I, I know that the invitation is not mine, it's yours. And I pray that you, the people here will respond to you. Maybe it's not coming forward. Maybe it's just standing right there and praying. Maybe it's committing their lives to do something differently. We love you, God. Your love does compel us to do some things that maybe we wouldn't do if we weren't compelled by you. So I'm praying that you will help us to have sensitive hearts and sensitive minds as we seek to do that. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.